let's smoothly move on to the, the seminar. Morning, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Depends where you where you're located right now. So it's my great pleasure to announce the restart of our optical seminars. And it's my, I would say, ultimate pleasure to introduce our the our first speaker of the re renovated optical seminar, Professor Alexander Bouillet from he kindly mentioned that he's from Saint Arras, but still I can I, I was training to pronounce uh, University de Bourgogne Franche Conte, but still. Uh, and he will be giving a talk on hot electrons and nonlinear optical antennas, or I mean, as mentioned here, the case of nonlinear fluminescence in plasmonics. And before giving a stage for uh, uh, Alexander, I would ask you to, in, in case you have questions, please raise your hand in the reaction section in Zoom, somewhere in the bottom, or type your question in the chat. I will try to gently stop Alexander at the proper moment. So, Alexander, please. Thank you very much. Really appreciate the invitation. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here today. You're saying I'm actually locating in Dijon, and uh, Dijon, uh, I think I have a slide on this. So, just to set uh, the record, so I hope you can see my pointer here. And yeah, so Dijon is located in the uh, central east part of the country, France. And I think uh, you may have heard about the city because it's famous for its condiment, the mustard. Although uh, the production is no longer uh, made in Dijon, uh, this is still a brand name. And um, well, if you happen to pass by France and, and visit the, uh, the area, I strongly suggest to, uh, to, be, uh, to hit downtown. It's, it's a mid-sized mid city, it's about 250 inhabitants, 1,000 inhabitants. So it's, it's rather small, but it has like a, a historical downtown, you know, that's some of the houses are from the Middle Age and it's, it's very nice to, you know, wander in the streets. And uh, if you'd like to know uh, more about this, so uh, you may ask uh, Diana, she spent uh, a year in Dijon. And uh, also I had to visit, the pleasure to invite uh, and to welcome Ivan Mushkin and Alexei Boshakov for, uh, for a few days also, uh, yeah, when was it, two or three years ago? I forgot. So uh, yeah, so welcome in Dijon. If you happen to pass by, send me an email. I will try to accommodate things uh, for you. Okay, so uh, let me move on to the uh, content of the talk now. And um, so we're going to be talking about, you know, nonlinear photoluminescence in, in, in gold. And this is in context of, you know, very strong nonlinearities that people have been reporting in, 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 uh, in, in metal structures or nanostructures, actually. And um, I've written, you know, all this uh, uh, nonlinear effects that you can find in literature, uh, multi-photon absorption, switching, biostability, interband excitation, care, nonlinearity is, of course, high harmonic generation for wave mixings and nonlinear photoluminescence. And this is by no means an, exist, an exhaustive uh, list, but this is basically uh, the most uh, popular uh, nonlinear interaction that are, um, you know, found in the literature uh, in, in plasmonics, actually. Today, um, we're going, I'm not going to be talking about all of these uh, nonlinear interactions, but I would rather focus my talk on uh, nonlinear photoluminescence. So I will set the stage. Uh, I will try to convey or explain what are the different interpretation has to, you know, what is the origin of this uh, nonlinear photoluminescence, the different schools uh, of thoughts you know, available in the community. It's still basically under debate. Um, and uh, once we've, you know, uh, gathered all of this, all this information, uh, I will try to show you some, uh, some applications that are device oriented um, that we are currently developing uh, using this nonlinear photoluminescence as a, a useful uh, observable, okay? So for me, um, nonlinear photoluminescence is, is, is a long story. Um, I started with this um, topic uh, way back then when I was still a, Jesus Christ, this wrong. Yeah, when I was still a postdoc uh, in Rochester with Lucas Novotny, as you can may recognize Lucas. It's like a 
pictures dating from 2003, so it's almost uh, you know 20 years now. And uh, next, sitting next to him is Mike Bevers Lewis, was a, a PhD student also at Lucas's group at the time. I was a postdoc, and uh, yeah, the three of us were starting to uh, to dwell on this on this nonlinear photoluminescence because. This was basically a background uh, contribution to what we were trying to, to look for. And, uh, you know, it turns out to be a, a scientific adventure um, that kept me busy since, uh, since that date. So it's something I've been investing a lot of effort into uh, over the past uh, 20 years. Um, and uh, just by saying <laughs> we've been working on this for the last 20 years, it's amazing. But anyway, um, so uh, what are we talking about here? So <clears throat> nonlinear photoluminescence. Um, so I, I will be, uh, you know, uh, most of the time you will see in my slide, this is abbreviated as NPL, so nonlinear photoluminescence. You may find different acronyms available in the literature like uh, TPL, uh, I'm going to come back into this, which will stand for two photon luminescence, or TPPL, which would stand for two photon photoluminescence. You will find also MPL, so for multi photon luminescence. There is this whole term terminology available in the, uh, in also avalanche, also uh, photoluminescence. All these terms be coined in the literature, but they're basically uh, encompassing the same phenomena, which for me, uh, I, I Better cast it into this uh, general, you know, uh, term as a nonlinear photoluminescence. So um, NPL has been seen first, first reported in uh, 1986, so 40 years ago almost, um, and um, it has been basically forgotten until 2003, where I was with Mike and, and Lucas starting to to look at uh, at this. So. Um, Basically, if you take a piece of gold and you shine that with a pulsed uh, laser, uh, so because it's a nonlinear signal at the end of the day, you will understand a little bit more later, but you need to have the high peak power of uh, pulsed uh, excitation. So uh, basically, the remaining of my talk, I will be uh, mostly focusing on uh, femtosecond uh, laser chains, okay? And uh, so when you shine line on the on, on gold and you with such a powerful uh, uh, pulse laser, um, this is a typical spectra that you can record um, from um, which are emitted basically by the by gold itself. So let me go through this spectra. So this is wavelengths, this is intensity, an arbitrary unit. It doesn't really matter. What you see here is. Uh, is basically a relay scattering from the laser. So we're using here a tie soft laser centered at 800 nanometer or 810 nanometer. So a um, bunch of filters that are basically cutting the uh, uh, the, the high wavelengths part uh, in order to block the laser. Uh, but what's interesting is that you can see that there is this uh, large uh, decaying curve uh, towards the uh, lowest wavelengths which is basically this nonlinear photoluminescence. So you can see that it is broadband and, and the different curves here were taken at uh, different laser intensities. And you can appreciate already that this is going nonlinear uh, with laser intensity. Of course, you will also find another nonlinear effect uh, in gold, which is uh, second harmonic generation. And you can see it uh, on that very peak here, which is a double frequency uh, from the laser. I'm not gonna be talking about that peak uh, today. This would be a matter of another talk, okay? Um, we're gonna be fo focusing essentially on this uh, up-converted nonlinear photoluminescence. And uh, on the on the right hand side here, you see a uh, very similar spectra uh, taken also from gold nanostructure back in uh, in 2003. This is spectra that we took with Mike and, and Lucas's. And uh, so this difference between you know a uh, pulsed excitation and uh, a CWU excitation. So uh, you can appreciate that this nonlinear photoluminescence spanning the entire visible region is only there when you have a pulse excitation, when you have this high peak intensity laser, and it's completely gone when you have a when you have a CWU steady state excitation. Um, 
Interestingly, there is this uh, large also photoluminescence background on the uh, Stokes side of the excitation. Um, again, I'm not going to be talking about this today. Uh, you just have to know that this is also photoluminescence coming from the gold. This one goes linear with the excitation. Uh, and uh, in the remaining of the talk, we'll be really mainly focusing on this uh, up converted uh, radiation, which has strong nonlinear dependence on the laser yeah, intensity. Okay, <clears throat> so um, Sorry, yeah. Alex, before we, we move on, yeah, yep. Andre has a question. Yeah, Andre, please. please. Yeah, yeah, yes, Alex, could you show the previous slide, please? Here we go. Yes, so uh, about the left panel. So we, we again, we, we pounded at 8 nanometers. It's a, yep. uh, like a pulse excitation. Yes. But what the object on, uh, what the object on the illumination? It's a film flake or nanoparticle. It doesn't really matter. It's basically gold in a some some sort of a nanostructured form, and uh, you will see. I'm not actually I'm not going to be talking too much about it, but basically the shape of the spectra is indeed depending on what kind of uh, structures you're looking at. Uh, okay, so this would be eventually modified by uh, resonances. If you have, for instance, a surface plasma resonance, the shape of the spectrum will be affected. But I basically on purpose, on purpose show this uh, very plain uh, spectrum where there is basically no surface plasma resonance that will shape the spectrum, just to extract a little bit more the physics that I will be explaining a little bit later. Okay, but so. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, and about the second harmonic generation, as we know, there is no bulk, uh, like uh, right. nonlinear responsibility, but it, it appears just because of the surface or ages at the gold. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's either uh, it's either mediated by a, uh, the breaking of the symmetry at the interface between the, you know, the yeah. outside of the structure or at one of the sharp edges uh, yeah. of the structure also. Yeah, so second harmonic and photoluminescence usually goes hand to hand. Um, so uh, they are, of course, respective weight is a little bit different, but usually when we have a strong uh, PL response, uh, we also have a, a strong second harmonic response. Okay. okay. I see. Okay, thank you. But uh, yeah, they, they follow different selection rules, but they are both sensitive to the uh, local electric field. So uh, when the local electric field is high, both of these signals are basically boosting up. Mm -hmm. And what are the, at the right panel, what is the peak in the gap at the lower panel? Here, yeah, exactly. That's also a reminiscence of the laser. So uh, the features that we're using didn't cut completely uh, the laser, and what we see here is a little bit of the uh, of the uh, of the high intense laser. Okay. So just to because it's so if you think about efficiency, of course you always have to think about efficiency. This is a very uh, extremely an efficient process. So uh, the typical ballpark for the efficiencies, we're talking about 10 to the minus 10. So in order to produce the one photon for this, uh, you know, nonlinear photoluminescence, you need to have 10 to the 10 uh, incoming of photons at the, uh, at the laser intensity. So the laser intensity usually is really high and we are, you know, working uh, with uh, very uh, uh, efficient detectors in order to record uh, this nonlinear photoluminescence. So it's a very inefficient process, but uh, it gives us a lot of clue of what's going on. I see. I see. Thank you. Okay, so let me move on uh, to the next slide, if I can. I need to click there. Here, right. So yeah, the, so this uh, nonlinear photoluminescence is something that you can see easily with any kind of gold structures or nano-sized, micro-sized structures. Uh, that you can produce with EB lithography or random deposition of uh, colloidal nanostructures. So as an example, here's something my student did back in 2015 to celebrate the uh, year of the light. And so she wrote some gold nanostructures by e-beam here. You can see this is not even nanometric, it's 10 micron in, in size, but when you put this uh, this kind of a sample under the optical microscope, confocal microscope, and you send that uh, you focus your light beam into uh, into a small spot and you start scanning uh, the structure through your through your focus and record uh, the light that is 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 coming out of the sample in this nonlinear regime, 
then you will see, you know, lots of lights, and you can nicely, uh, you know, produce uh, uh, a new uh, uh, an optical image of this nonlinear uh, photoluminescence. And the idea is that now is how do we understand the origin of this uh, nonlinear photoluminescence? And uh, there are basically uh, different rule of sco uh, school of thoughts. And the first one that has been proposed uh, back then, uh, at the beginning of the discovery of this, uh, of this phenomenon, and this is something also I've been promoted in the past, is that the nonlinearity is uh, coming at the absorption. So uh, why this is, well, whenever you have a nonlinear signal, the first thing that you try to, to do in order to characterize it is to look at the uh, dependence of the signal with respect to the uh, intensity of your laser. Okay, and uh, so if you do this, um, so I'm representing here in linear scale, but this is a log of the intensity versus a log of the power. And if you look at the, uh, you integrate all your signals coming from this uh, photoluminescence uh, spectrum I showed you before, and you put this on this on the, on the photo detector, and you increase the laser power, and you will see that this photoluminescence generally follows a quadratic dependence, okay? pretty much actually like the uh, second harmonic generation, which is a second order, uh, second order effect, okay? And also shows a quadratic dependence to, uh, to laser power. So um, people have been discussing this uh, quadratic dependence in terms of uh, two photon absorption um, in analogy with what we know with molecular excitation, where you use also, you know, highly intense laser in order to produce this uh, two photon induced uh, photoluminescence from uh, single molecules, which also shows a quadratic dependence. And uh, so by analogy, people were making this assumption that this photoluminescence is also coming from, uh, well, two photons because we measure uh, quadratic dependence uh, with laser power. And uh, so on the right hand side there here, I'm, I'm basically plotting uh, a calculation of this, uh, of the local density of states, of the density of states for electrons in, in the gold, uh, in the gold structure. Um, you can recognize that below, this is a Fermi edge and below the Fermi energy, you have lots of uh, available, uh, you have lots of electrons here in the D bands. And then you have this empty space here, which are the SP band of the uh, of the uh, of the lattice of the uh, of the band structure, and uh, so this two photon uh, absorption can take place uh, between this D band uh, all the way to the SP band via a multi photon interband uh, transitions. Okay where you will first promote uh, an electron uh, from the D band to the SP band through one photon transition. And then you can have the second photon absorbed to promote a hole lying uh, deeper in the D band and fill the gap uh, here, basically. And then you will have successive uh, recombination between the hole uh, created in the D band and the hole and the electrons in the SP band. And this gives rise to this broadband photoluminescence um, especially around this symmetry point of the Brian zone, which is basically the X and the L points where the band structure will allow this uh, two photon transitions. Yeah. Here you will see uh, the density of states for the electrons. And you will see that again, um, there's a lot of electrons, you know, lying at a few EV down from the Fermi edge. And since we are using a laser at 1.7 EV, right? So one photon is not enough. So you need to have two photons in order to bring an electron from the D band to the, uh, to the SP band. And this was for a long time, the accepted basically uh, interpretation of this nonlinear photoluminescence. Things got shaky at some points because uh, people figured that for most of the time, um, it was indeed uh, a quadratic dependence with laser intensity, but sometimes the, linear, the linearity was, uh, could be higher, okay? So here I'm Alex, showing- sorry, sorry. I yes. have a question regarding the slide. So Dima, please. Dimitri, yeah, uh, please. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, yes. perfect. So my question, uh, my question about uh, second order in photoluminescence. Could you please show this slide one more time? This one? Yes, yes. So um, 
I clearly understand how uh, one can measure uh, a blue line for a second harmonic. We just have to, for example, uh, increase uh, pump power mm -hmm. and um, we can uh, see the maximum of second harmonic signal. Mm -hmm. And then we just plot uh, this graph. But what about photoluminescence? Uh, should uh, one integrate all the signal to plot this or, or how to plot this figure? Yeah, this is a good question. Usually people were actually doing this. So, uh, so let me go back one more slide, um, if I can. A few more slides. So basically here you have different ways of doing this. And the most common way is to using a, a photo detector, single pixel photo detector, like an avalanche photodiode. Uh, so you have a filters, that, a filters that basically remove the second harmonic uh, from, the, from the discussion and you integrate all of the signal onto your detector. I ramp up the uh, laser power and measure what kind of counts, uh, integrated counts do you have, and then you can plot the graph. And usually when you do this, you end up with a quadratic dependence or close to a quadratic dependence. But the question is good because uh, I, will explain, I will be explaining a little bit later that when you do a uh, spectral decomposition of the uh, power dependence, uh, you have a, a drastically different uh, uh, story. Okay, thank you. And in uh, in these procedures, should uh, I somehow somehow to um, delete second harmonic signal? Because uh, if I want to integrate all the photoluminescence, we ha I have a, a second harmonic signal in the spectra. Right. So usually, uh, usually what we do is it's well that would be uh, structure dependent. I would say sometimes second harmonic is a weak is a weak signal compared to the overall nonlinear photoluminescence peak or signal sometimes it's predominant but indeed uh, what we usually do is basically cut out the second harmonic and of course when you do this you will sacrifice a little bit of the uh, pl response because the second harmonic sits also on the photoluminescence on the second harmonic peak so the reason why we don't see much of of the light extending towards the blue side of the spectrum is because of intraband transitions so uh Basically, uh, the interpretation is that the NPL, which is emitted as a broadband signal here, will start heating the interband transition for one photon and the structure or the goal will be reabsorbing basically that emitted power. And this is why it's, it's very inefficient in the blue side of the spectrum. Okay. Of course, if you change on your material, if you go from gold or if you, if you move from gold to, to silver, you'll be able to extend uh, this uh, nonlinear photoluminescence a little bit uh, higher in the blue side of the spectrum. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks Dima. Andre, please, short question, yes. Yes. Okay, short question. So about some time scales, if you're talking about like a dark band semiconductors, the luminescence times is usually about 10 to, to the minus nine, so nanosecond. Right. Yes. Uh, what about here in, in gold? What are the typical time scale? Yeah, I'm going to come back into this in a, in a, in a few slides. Sure. Great. Thank because you. it's it's part of the story. It's obviously part of the story. OK, so I was mentioning that most of the time it's, it's, it's quadratic. So uh, to, to if you integrate the response in one detector and you measure all the spectral, the, all the wavelengths at the same time, as a function of laser intensity, usually have this quadratic dependence. But people have been also noticing that this is not a systematic. Okay, so um, you get this this paper from Bert Echt back in 2005, where uh, he showed uh, evidence for uh, this broadband uh, up to a nonlinearity order of four. Okay, so uh, four photons involved. Okay, and uh, and you see here in this, uh, also in this uh, 2005 paper that the slope actually might not be an integer number. Uh, you may have uh, non-integer numbers, of course, this is close to three, uh, but I think it's um, these non-integer non numbers uh, were very uh, uh, worrisome in the, in the context of this two photon absorption or multi-photon absorption. And then this, this 2016 paper that we, we published together with Regis um, Eja was a postdoc in, a, in our group, um, where he measured, I'm going to come back to this graph a little bit later, but he measured also very high nonlinear order, as you can see here, up to eight, okay, as a, in, a, in a two probe, two pump, uh, two pulse experiment, pump and probe. 
varying the uh, either uh, either the pump intensity or the probe intensity, you could see that there is a nice uh, uh, you can you can end up with very high nonlinear uh, orders uh, when things are a little bit delayed between the the distance between the two pulses. And of course, this uh, this interpretation is diff difficult to reconcile with the uh, with the interpretation of a multi-photon absorption. Maybe a four photon can still be explained. Uh, one, two, or three, four photons may still be explained by looking at the band structure of gold. Okay, and you have this uh, three photon or four photon absorption between the D band and the E band as you move uh, away from this uh, characteristic characteristic point of the Brian zone. But um, there's something fishy in, to the, in this interpretation because uh, as you go with a higher order nonlinearities, uh, your signal should go weaker, right? This is, this is well known in, uh, in nonlinear optics. Uh, usually uh, the efficiency uh, goes down with nonlinearity orders. And um, that's completely contra contra contradictory to what was reported uh, in the previous uh, uh, papers I just showed uh, in, in the graph before. So there's something fishy that needs to be uh, to be understood uh, because this uh, multi-photon uh, absorption is is probably not uh, the truth. Uh, on the it's probably not explaining the full basically origin of this nonlinear photoluminescence. Then there is this uh, second uh, school of thought, uh, which basically states that the nonlinearity is no longer in the absorption, but the nonlinearity is at the emission uh, of the light. And there is this uh, two papers that are that was very interesting. Uh, back into the first one states is, is coming from 2014. Um, which basically uh, revisited the problem from the uh, spectroscopic point of view and they um, advanced um, the hypothesis basically that this uh, upconverted signal here that you see in this uh, anti-Stokes part of the spectrum. So the laser intensity would be here and then you have negative Raman shifts for the upconverted luminescence and the uh, in the regular photoluminescence in this uh, Stoke part of the uh, of the spectrum, and the interpretation of this was uh, from this author that this uh, uh, Stoke anti-Stokes shift were coming from uh, Raman scattering, okay, and uh, in in this nonlinear photoluminescence was seen as a secondary uh, emission emission process and and this is like in in elastic way because of course you're producing uh, energies at higher uh, frequencies, uh, you may, you're producing wavelengths or yeah, frequencies are higher than the, uh, than the uh, than your laser, okay? And the interesting point in this uh, study is that this nonlinear process uh, was created by a high temperature distribution of electrons. And the hypothesis of that work, and I think this was uh, very interesting because it started to pinpoint uh, an effect that was known otherwise is that following basically the absorption of the pulse, uh, the nanostructure is going to have a, uh, will be out, out of equilibrium, right? So you're gonna have all the uh, pulse energy absorbed by the electron subsystem. And these electrons will be brought at uh, elevated temperature, which is not at equilibrium with the lattice, okay? So um, I've seen that, that back in uh, June uh, last year, you guys had a beautiful talk from uh, Jonathan Sieven about the role of hot electrons in uh, photocatalysis, okay? And uh, well, I'm gonna be using the same terminology here because we're gonna be talking about hot, hot electrons at some point. Slight differences between uh, uh, Jonathan's message and my message is that in Jonathan's work, um, it was mainly interesting at the steady state solution, okay? So with CW excitation, we are using here a pulsed excitation. So there is definitely like a time dependence of this, uh, of the evolution of the system. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that uh, I'm not interested at extracting my hot electrons out of the surface to do some chemistry, okay? Uh, the hot electrons are still, uh, in my point of view, uh, uh, remains on the, uh, on the particles and they're just brought at elevated temperature. 
And, uh, and also, uh, we'll be considering a slightly different families of hot electrons. And this is about semantics, but just to set the record straight with what I'm going to be talking about later on is that these hot electrons are considered thermalized between each other. So uh, we can assume that the electron distribution follow a Fermi Dirac distribution. Okay, these are not non thermal electrons, which will be uh, swiftly produced after the absorption of the pulse. So here we're dealing about, you know, electrons that are already thermalized between each other to form the Fermi Dirac distribution. And they are in the process of exchanging the energy to the lattice, to the phonons, in, uh, in this uh, kinetic dynamics uh, decay of, of, of the energy. Okay, so uh, anyway, so the principle here says that, okay, so we create this high electron temperature uh, and this nonlinear process is at the origin of this uh, hot electron uh, distribution. And there is this beautiful paper after that, one year after, from the Lupton group that actually uh, revisited also this interpretation from a slightly different point of view. But at the end of the day, uh, the message is, very, is, is, is also the same, is that after the absorption of the pulse by the nanoparticles, you have a time-dependent hot electron gas that will evolve eventually. And during the, uh, the, basically the message of the paper here says that during that time where the electron system is really hot, then it is able to emit spontaneously a, a radiation. Uh, because you basically uh, uh, through a spontaneous decay of this hot electron gas. And that lasts only for basically during the time it takes to cool the electrons into the phonons. And one of the uh, tail mark of this effect uh, is exactly uh, what's uh, written in this, uh, what's specified in this graph here on the left panel. So they took basically spectra, this is the log scale, and they look at, you know, um, the evolution of the spectrum with laser power for each energy inside the spectrum, okay? Then they have this uh, uh, nonlinear order dependence as a function of wavelengths, and this power low exponent is now plotted in the bottom graph as the energy of the photon, uh, as a function of the photon energy, okay? And what they saw is remarkable. We'll be focusing here on this right hand side here of the panel, which is this up converted photon, okay? So this is at higher energy than the laser. Laser somewhere sits here. So we're looking at the photon energy here up to uh, 3 eV, uh, maybe two, yeah, a little bit short of 3 eV. And what they found is, is that they have a, a linear relationship between the uh, poor low exponent P and the photon energy. So to specifically answer the uh, previous question is that, yes, if you integrate the whole spectrum into one detector, then you get a, a quasi quadratic dependence. Sometimes it's non integer okay? But now if you do a, a spectrum analysis of this power dependence, you will find that the nonlinearity order scales linearly with the photon energy. And uh, this was basically completely expected um, from a hot distribution of a, of a hot electrons, okay? So this NPL can be seen as basically the fading uh, glow of the uh, cooling mass of electrons, which were poor, uh, brought at uh, elevated temperature right after the pulse. So you get this, basically this all different mechanisms uh, that uh, were uh, put forward uh, to, to understand the, uh, the, this NPL. So you can have multi-photon absorption, okay, between the, the bands of the gold. You can have this uh, Raman scattering, and then you can have this intraband luminescence, so, okay, which is basically um, uh, modified by uh, a, a, a change in the Fermi Dirac distribution that is not at room temperature because halotrons are hot right after the uh, right after these uh, after the pulse. Okay, so uh, is this hot electron uh, gas? picture explanation plausible with the rest of the experiment that has been published uh, here and there. Well, and this is going back also to one of the questions that was raised, what is the typical lifetime of this effect? 
Well, this is a this is a 2009 paper from the uh, from my colleagues in Milano, where they were looking at the uh, uh, efficiency of the process as a function of pulse duration and you can see that as you increase the pulse duration the efficiency uh, basically drops down and saturates whenever the uh, pulse duration is is around one picosecond okay so one picosecond this is a typical relaxation time for electron phonon scattering okay slightly uh, slightly faster you take maybe 500 femtoseconds depending on the system but this is definitely consistent with the uh, ultra fast relaxation dynamics of the uh, of the electrons. Okay, so it doesn't matter. It doesn't. You don't necessarily need. Uh, you don't gain too much by uh, making a shorter uh, uh, pulse duration. You have more intensity. You would probably have a higher damage, a lower damage threshold. But in terms of uh, of, uh, of uh, optimum, you'd better hit uh, a pulse duration that is close to the electron phonon relaxation time in order to maximize efficiency. The other thing that was also interesting in this context is this uh, the lifetime of, of uh, that that has been measured with two pulse experiment. So this is my colleague uh, Olivier. Uh, we did uh, together with Olivier. We did this experiment back in 2016. So here you take a two pulse experiment, okay, and then uh, you record this uh, nonlinear photoluminescence as a function of delay between the two pulses. Um, so you can see what's interesting here is this decay here. Okay, so this is the first part of the uh, is is interesting, but this is basically uh, intrapulse interferences when the two pulses perfectly overlap into onto your sample. But what's interesting is that when you start to have uh, uh, a delay in between the two pulses, you have a non-zero uh, nonlinear photoluminescence signal which is still generated. Okay, which eventually uh, goes to uh, one and one. Uh, when the two pulses are strongly separated. And uh, this is basically a measure of the lifetime of this, uh, of this, uh, of this, uh, of this signal, basically. So it's a very convenient way to estimate the lifetime. And what we found back in the days is that this lifetime depends on the resonance. So if you, have a, if you do this on a, on, a, on, a, on a nano wire or nano rod, actually, you can have different resonances. And this is a function of length, so you can see a first resonance in the signal here, uh, a first resonance in the signal there, and the second there. And what we can see is that this uh, lifetime, that is basically the exponential decay of that curve here, will depend, is depending on the, uh, on, on, on the presence of, a, of an excitation, of a resonance excitation. And this is understood from the fact that when light is absorbed, at resonance light is absorbed more efficiently, okay, which leads to a stronger uh, electronic uh, temperature, and a stronger electronic, uh, more important elevated uh, electronic temperature will also lead to a longer time uh, for electron phonon to exchange, and this is exactly what we see in the measurements here. So everything seems to be also consistent with, uh, with this uh, 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 electron picture. And the last thing also that for me uh, was interesting is with this, we could also explain this very high nonlinearity order that we observed in 2016 that cannot possibly be explained by a multiphoton uh, uh, pass into the, uh, uh, the band manifold of gold. Okay. And um, well, just as a picture, what you see here on the right hand side is Planck's law. It's basically Planck's law straight from the formula. And what I'm plotting here is the, uh, the light intensity in large scale at, what, at one wavelength, okay, as a function of electron temperature. Here, the wavelength is a 600 nanometer ish kind of, uh, of, uh, of numbers, if I remember correctly. And what you see here is that you have a, a very strong nonlinear dependence with electronic temperature. And remarkably, um, what people have been doing uh, in the past uh, when they were measuring this quadratic dependence, uh, it's, it's remarkable to see that they probably were looking at a very high uh, electronic temperature, somewhere between uh, you know, 2,500 to 3,500. And in this regime, the nonlinearity, if you fit this basically, if you fit that small portion of the curve with uh, an exponent, it's actually close to two. So it's very interesting to see that 
we people have been basically lured um, that this this quadratic behavior or quasi quadratic behavior was a multi-photon process, but actually it's just a manifest manifestation of this non-linearity of Planck's flow. And of course, as the electron bath is getting uh, is getting uh, cooler and cooler, you have this very strong nonlinear uh, dependence uh, with electronic temperature that can be explained here, that can explain basically the, 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 the shape of this curve here. And you see that for long delay between the two pulses, that is, we're basically probing a, um, a, 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 a decay, um, a cooling, basically, electron bath, then we have this nonlinearity order. I can see that uh, Jonathan has a, has, a, has a question. Yes, Jonathan, please. Yes, uh, well, it's thank you very much. You're explaining this in a very, very clear way. Uh, I'm wondering about the plot on the right. Yeah. How was the electron temperature determined here? That's a calculation, but- uh... Yeah, it's pure, it's, it's Planck's law. It's Planck's law. I'm just putting any kind of, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's in the expression of Planck's law and putting TE. I'm just looking at the shape of the curve. No, but the red- dots Yeah, the red part, right. It's experiments and this is coming from another experiment. And uh, complicated to explain right now, but it's just a trend okay. of the curve that we should, we should be taking care of, not about the red point. So, okay. So okay. no, so, uh, okay. I mean, I, I have to answer the question. So the red <laughs> points here, sorry. So the red points here were measured for a different system that was not optically pumped, but electrically pumped. So that's why I don't want to make a, a fair, I want to make a, a, it's hard to make a fair comparison. So the data okay. points we're not taking from optically excited structure, but electrically excited structure. Different okay. ways of uh, putting electron gas at a different temperature. Okay. Uh, it's just the I shape guess I'll have to read this properly. Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, I, I come back maybe a, a little bit later in the slide and I will I will go back to your question. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so estimation of the hot electron temperature. So this is going uh, going to uh, to your, your Jonathan's uh, question is how do we do this? Um, we actually have two ways of doing this. So we take the spectra uh, for different uh, excitation condition. And uh, if there is no strong resonance in the structure, we basically have a decaying tail, which is reminiscence of Planck's law, and we just fit this uh, with, uh, with, with Planck's law, basically, and, uh, and deduce what is the temperature of, of, this curve, of, the, uh, of the corresponding curves. Of course, this is like a very basic uh, approximation, and this only works if you don't have any resonances that are shaping your spectrum. Uh, but uh, in this particular realization, it's actually working pretty well. Uh, you can see that depending on the excitation, my electron temperature or deduced electron temperature reaches, you know, for the maximum uh, about 260,000 uh, degrees, so, so which is fairly high uh, temperature. So the first way of determining the temperature. The second way of determining the temperature is looking at the uh, exponent, the uh, power exponent, and, uh, and fitting this uh, uh, exponent with, with what is expected from Planck's law. Okay, so uh, what we do here, let me go through these uh, three graphs here. First of all, we take uh, the uh, intensity at a given wavelength. So you take, for instance, uh, a 750 nanometer, you change the irradiance of your laser and you fit this curve, you have one exponent. You take another one at 600 nanometer, you have another exponent, okay? And then you plot all these exponents as a function of wavelengths. And you see that we recall what we've seen in, back in, uh, in, uh, in Lupton's paper that I was mentioning before, we have a linear dependence with uh, wavelengths for the uh, anti-Stokes part of the spectrum. And this is sort of linear, uh, with wavelengths for the uh, for the for the uh, regular, I would say, photoluminescence in the Stokes size. So once we get this exponent here, this exponent is expected to follow that curve, that uh, relationship. So we fit the slope here, and uh, fitting the slope, we can extract uh, the electronic temperature as a function of irradiance. And what you see here is basically this dotted line, and this is actually 
in 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 well in a very fairly good approximation which what has been simply deduced by fitting the curve with Planck's law. Okay, so we have a nice one-to-one uh, -one correspondence uh, between this analysis. Of course, the underlying physics is the same; it's Planck's law, but we have two ways of bringing Planck's law Planck's law in the in the system. So, since everything seems to be consistent again with this hot electron picture, and the last. The last bit of a, of, a, of a clue that I wanted to bring is that we spent that, uh, and this is a work that has been done with Constantin, uh, one of my PhD, um, trying to measure the photon statistics for this uh, nonlinear photoluminescence. And uh, well, it should not come as a surprise um, that these photon statistics are uh, characteristics of photon bunching, which is expected from you know, chaotic source. Uh, chaotic light source, and uh, in our system, uh, you know, if it's if it's uh, if it's basically thermally activated electrons that are uh, emitting light, uh, this is a highly chaotic source, and uh, we expect to have characteristic of a uh, photon bunching. And um, well, it was a hard experiment uh, to do because we have to fight. Uh, you know, make sure that we have enough photon counts to uh, cut down the integration to a few hours, but yet be, be uh, below a damage threshold. So uh, Constantin spent a lot of time trying to extract this uh, this G2 measurements, but you can see that there is a clear uh, peak above one here uh, in this uh, uh, second order correlation function for the uh, photon statistics, and which is basically the total the, the telltale signature of, uh, of, of photon bunching. Okay, um, the other thing also I wanted to show you is that this uh, nonlinear photoluminescence has been you know, heavily reported in literature for gold. And, uh, but this is something which is way more generic than gold. And, and, and this is also strength, strengthening the fact that this nonlinearity is not coming from particularity of the band structure of gold through a multi-photon absorption, but it's just something which is related to the electron gas at hot, elevated at, hot, at a hot, uh, at elevated temperature, sorry. And, uh, you know, you can bring, uh, you can bring many structures, you can excite basically the Fermi gas to, uh, to an elevated temperature in many systems. And here I show you, uh, of course, different for, uh, gold again, but at different forms. So yeah, here you have a nanoparticle of gold and you have this corresponding spectra. Here you have a rough film, the corresponding spectra. Here, here you have a, a, a single crystal flake of gold and you also have spectra. Spectra are all differing, of course, because there is this underlying uh, local density of stakes that, that must be uh, taken into account, but it's still, all uh, reminiscent of a decaying tail in a visible part of a spectrum. So this NPL is also visible in silver. Uh, so this is, for instance, an image of a silver nanowire. And you can see that this, uh, the decaying curve uh, for silver, which is very much looking like qualitatively to the gold structure. And we also re uh, recently find out that uh, this is occurring also in ITO. So uh, ITO is, is, is a uh, indium tin oxide. So it's a semiconductor material with uh, lots of electrons because it is a uh, conductive materials. And we found that by structuring the ITO, we have a very strong nonlinear photoluminescence in the spectra, the spectrum that we, we could observe from this uh, strong ITO uh, responses were very much looking like the silver or the gold. So it seems to be a very generic effect which uh, uh, is occurring as soon as you can bring the electrons at a heavy de temperature with a photosecond uh, pulse laser. Okay, and to 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 talk to to answer basically uh, um, Jonathan's uh, comment, um, we also made the link to another physics. And what I'm showing you here is a comparison between uh, an optical optically pumped system. On the right hand side, on the left hand side, this is what we've been talking about for the last half an hour, and electrical pumping of a device uh, with very similar characteristics. 
And uh, so here is this is optical image. So we focus the light beam here and we record the uh, nonlinear photoluminescence. In this image here, we inject electrons in a very small gap. I don't wanna go too much in the details, but we also record nonlinear, uh, well, we also record light uh, coming from this uh, light, uh, this uh, electron uh, injection device. And uh, if you look at the spectra, they also look very similar, okay? They have the same features, we have an upconverted signal, so we have more energy than we put in. In this system here, as you can see, this is the applied bias, and this is the, uh, the, the detected wavelength. So we have a bias of 550 here. Uh, well, maybe take the 750 uh, mEV, and we record light up to, uh, to a few EV. So we have also this, uh, what we call anomalous over bias emission, which is basically exactly the same as an upconverted signal. We found that this was very nonlinear with electrical power, and these are the uh, red dots. That's how uh, we uh, ex extracted the red dots in the curve that Jonathan was commented. And those show this black body-like emission, okay? And, and the similarity is also expected here, which just think that you can appreciate that no matter how you bring the electron temperature high, uh, at, at elevated temperature, the electron distribution elevated temperature, they will emit a very similar spectrum. So whether it's an optical pumping or if it's an electrical pumping. So it's basically two different physics, but the same uh, with the same effects. Okay, so uh, I see that time is running. I just wanted to, uh, 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 I don't wanna repeat myself there, but to show you basically uh, what we can do with all of this. The first thing that is very interesting to me, and this was like a, a serendipity kind of experiment, is that we found that NPL is actually, this nonlinear photoluminescence is not necessarily only coming from the excitation spot, which, which was, you know, the vast majority of the research that has been published uh, previously was just like, you excite somewhere and you collect the same position. Well, uh, it actually turns out that this NPL, it can be delocalized in the structure. Of course, if you look at the single particle, uh, the NPL is localized in the particle. And if it's smaller than your diffraction limit of your microscope, so you won't see anything. But if you look at 2D objects, uh, you know, slightly bigger than the uh, point spread function of the microscope, then you start to appreciate that the NPL is actually not coming from a single point, but from the entire structure itself. And this is here exemplifying these two, uh, two structures here. So here's a 2D gold crystals. I don't know if you can see the uh, dimension, but it's like five micron across. And uh, when you shoot your laser right at the center, of course you have a strong response uh, from the structure right at the center. This, this is NPL, but you can see also that, and this is an image plane image, not a confocal. This is what you would see if you would put your eyes in your microscope, okay? Um, and you can see that also all the edges here are lighting up. So NPL is not only coming from the excitation spot, but is also coming from the edges of the structures. Okay. And this was very surprising to us. Yes, Jonathan. Yeah, just a quick question. This is the, uh, the whole spectrum or this is just the anti-stokes or- both This is the anti-stokes. Anti just anti-stokes. Anti-stokes, yeah. So it's basically a filtering, you filter out the laser wavelengths, you filter out the second harmonic and you take whatever is in between your laser wavelengths and the second harmonic. So I would say most of the visible. So anything between 450 to 750 nanometer uh, contributes to the signal. Okay, so in this case, the, the non-locality is obvious because the whole sample heats up and you have... Yeah, well, um, the whole sample is no, the right. whole sample heats up. Yeah, the electrons yeah. of the whole sample... So that explains the non-locality. Okay. Yes, absolutely. And, and yeah. uh, so uh, the, 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 the vector uh, which mediates this uh, non-locality is actually uh, the surface plasma model landscape. So if you have a surface plasma in the system and that you are exciting with your laser, and then you will have a distribution of plasma in this 2D structure. Of course, you have a very complex pattern, but that complex matter pattern is basically sucking up the uh, laser energy and it's going to be a pump also a femtosecond uh, plasma that is distributed around the structure and which we create locally all these nonlinearities that are, uh, I mean, bringing the electron gas at elevated temperature and then that creates substantially this secondary emission seen as NPL. So this is seen here in this uh, 2D structure, but it's a little bit more obvious here in this uh, 
uh, nanowire. So you see here you have nanowires of different lengths. So uh, the left hand side here is basically at the fundamental wavelengths. This is the pump wavelengths. And you can see that if you shoot your laser right at the uh, uh, at this extremity, you have also light coming at the other end, which is basically the signature of a plasma propagating in the nanowire. Okay, and you can nicely see here for the longest nanowire, you excite here and you have light coming from the other side. Okay, now if you spectrally integrate the, NP, the anti Stokes part of the signal, okay, so you just collecting the NPL, getting, getting rid of the uh, pump. You also have a very, uh, this delocalized uh, NPL signal coming from all over the nanowire. So basically the nanowire is, is basically, the whole structure is glowing itself, okay? And you can see, you can nicely appreciate how far this NPL extends all the way to the very end. And the, uh, the, our understanding of this is that the surface plasma is carrying out the energy of the pump Right, and during propagation, locally creates or locally bring the electron gas at elevated temperature, and then re-emits as NPR signal as it propagates. Yeah, Dimitri, I think I have a question there. Uh, yes, I, I would like to ask you one more time. Do I understand you correctly that so in this system we excite plasmon polariton exact on the pump frequency, not at all of photoluminescence? Frequencies. Well, it's a good question. It's a it's a little bit more complex than what I'm I'm, I'm trying to uh, to convey here. Of course, uh, you excite surface plasma at many at all these uh, frequencies because it's a local source. At the end of the day, it's very local, so you will have condition to excite a surface plasma plasma polariton at all the wavelengths. However, as I said before, the conversion efficiency of the process is very small. Uh, we're talking about ten to the ten, ten to the minus ten. Sorry. So all the plasma that will be uh, excited at these uh, NPL wavelengths will be way more dimmer than the, than the plasma at the fundamental frequency, which is creating most of the signal. So yes, yes, you, you, you have this, but this is a, a, a negligible portion of the story. Thank you, I understand, yes. Okay, so uh, it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon now because you can uh, start, you know, thinking about what can we do with this delocalized signal, which is uh, nonlinear and uh, transported through the structure by the plasma landscape. And one of the ideas that we had with my friend, uh, my colleague Eric Dujardin here, uh, named, you can see his name over there, there at CMS in Toulouse in south of France, is to do plasmonic Boolean calculus. And the idea is once we understand that everything is mediated by the uh, model landscape, then we can start shaping the landscape by on purpose carving these uh, cavities into something which is designed. And I'm gonna show you here a brief movie. I hope it's gonna go through uh, through the, uh, well, I don't know. So the movie doesn't want to, uh, to go. Well, it doesn't really matter. So basically, uh, let me go back to the laser point here. You start with a, a well-defined single crystal flake because you want to have less, uh, you know, uh, you want to have the best uh, kind of system possible. Then uh, th what the movie would have shown is that uh, we are fibbing, we're using a focused ion beam to structure the th to structure the flake into something which is engineered on purpose design in order to make this uh, Boolean calculus. So, um, the principle behind this is, is the following. Um, <clears throat> so this is basically the shape that we uh, that we designed. So it's it's basically a double hexagon, okay. And uh, for convenience reason, uh, you can basically assume that the left hand side of the hexagon is the entry port, and uh, the right hand side of the hexagons will be the output ports, okay. So this is, would be our, basically our computer, our this arithmetic and logic unit that will do the calculation. Then in order to do Boolean uh, logic, uh, we need to define uh, some inputs and outputs, right? So as I said, the inputs would be uh, on the right hand, on the left hand side, and this would be materialized by these uh, red circles. And these red circles are basically the excitation points. This is where we're gonna be parking our laser onto that structure, okay? And then we can define also some output ports, and these are the black circles here. And uh, for convenience C, uh, we usually, find that this NPL response is stronger at the apices 
of the structure. And this is logically where we find, we target our, our uh, we put our uh, uh, outputs. Then we are encoding the logical states, so zero and one into the polarization. So for instance, in this uh, uh, example here, um, a zero would be a, a, a polarization along this direction and the one would be a 45 degree tilt polarization. Then we play the game. So we are reconstructing the table of truths by uh, sending one beam, uh, let's say on this, uh, on this input, which is here, I1. Then we have another I put, I3. And by changing the polarization, we can have all the uh, table of truths. And then uh, the output of the table will be given by this NPL intensity transported across the structure. Uh, and as, as this example, that will be uh, measured at O2. So we'll, here we're looking at the intensity of a signal as the output logic state. So if the output of the logic state is higher than a given threshold, here this is basically an end, uh, example of, of an end, okay? So you need to have one and one, and if one encoded as, the, as this polarization state, and then we, if we have a strong response of that corner, uh, above a threshold, then it's higher than all the rest, and then we have an end gate. Okay, so to show you uh, here, for instance, here I have a little movie uh, showing you this nonlinear delocalization, the uh, delocalization of the nonlinear signal for fixed input. I have one single beam here, and this is located in I3. So this apex, and what I'm changing here is the input polarization from zero degrees to 180 degrees. And you can see that the pattern, and this is basically what you can record by looking at inside the microscope. So this is a video record with a CCD camera. You can see that the light uh, is completely uh, depending or the, the structure, you can see for instance here that this is lining up as a function of polarization. So. You basically, by changing the polarization, you project your signal onto different modal uh, uh, plasmon modes, basically. And these modes are uh, transporting the nonlinearity inside the structure and gives rise to this uh, to the signal. And this is how we're going to be uh, measuring our uh, logic gates. So here's an example. So we have now two inputs. OK, so I have an input here and a second input there. I'm having this uh, quotes for the uh, polarization for encoding the, uh, the states, okay? I'm reconstructing the maps. So I have a CCD camera. I got basically four images uh, for each of these uh, polarization states. And then I can uh, do an algorithm in order to reproduce or to extract basically where do I have uh, optical gates, Boolean gates maps. And you see that for instance, I have an end emerging up at this location. I have an end at the other, at this apex here. I have an or, I have an or. So I have a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, simple uh, optical gates, which are completely reconfigurable because I can definitely e easily change the input uh, encoding of my, uh, of my polarization states. And you can see that with the same uh, arithmetic and uh, logic units, I can have simultaneously many of the uh, simple state, uh, simple gates. So these experiments were done for two inputs, but so I mean two pulses, but they were not synchronized. Okay, so I had one pulse hitting the sample, and then I have a second uh, pulse coming on the other uh, ports, input ports, and I'm just averaging out in time everything. Now things are coming a little bit more interesting when you are synchronizing the two pulses because you can project on two different, on, on the different modes of the structure. And these modes can interfere coherently inside the structure. And you have a, basically, uh, you can use a different uh, a width, more information basically. And this is all us, allows us to actually achieve very complex gates uh, or more complex gate like the XOR or the XNOR. And you can see where they can emerge in, this, uh, in these experiments. And the interesting thing is that combination of XOR and AND is, is basically the, uh, or, uh, the ingredients to produce a half adder. Okay, so we're starting to increase the complexity of these gates now uh, by using this uh, coherent superposition of the two beams inside the structure, which are producing this NPL. So it's interesting to see that, you know, 
going from the very fundamental question with, okay, electrons are at uh, elevated temperatures, they produce luminescence, and then we are using this luminescence as basis for defining a, a, a device. Okay, uh, I think I need to go speed up. I have maybe two or three more slides to, to show you. I think it's interesting results. Can I have? Of course, it's very interesting, so no hurry. Okay, okay, so I don't have to speed up that much. <laughs> no, okay, still. Um, the other, the last part of, uh, of this talk is, is something that we stumbled upon, you know, some, some times ago, maybe five years ago, in, in, a, in a, we're thinking about, you know, how do we go from static devices, by, by, I mean by static, so you produce a sample, you know, you go to your e-beam, you produce a sample, then you get, you look at the NPL, and then you understand the response, but the response is fixed. It's given by the property of the sample. How do we do, how do we go active? Can we modify the uh, nonlinear response of the device? Basically, can we modify the uh, nonlinear photoluminescence signal by uh, uh, an external stimuli? And what we've done here is this external stimuli is basically a, a voltage activation. And the example here is, or the sample looks basically like this. What we've done here is we have, we produced a small gap between two nanowires. And uh, so the advantage of a small gap is we knew that the, it's because you have enhanced uh, optical fields there and usually the NPL response is really strong. So we wanted to start our experiment with something that gives out a lot of signal. And then we basically brought electrical contacts to these nanowires, okay? And the hope was to apply a bias, some, some zeros, some ones, okay? And see if we could, you know, modulate the intensity of the NPL by applying a bias. So this is the example of a, of a gap uh, that we produced. So you see it's maybe a 50 nanometer gap separating two electrodes. We basically focusing our laser here and we have a strong NPL response. Okay, I'm gonna show you a movie, hope it's gonna be working, um, of the sample. So uh, here is, this is a movie, or it's, it's an image that was recorded uh, inside the microscope. So you see this uh, electro, large electrodes here, there are many devices in this, uh, in this chip, but uh, what you see here is a small lights uh, coming, uh, coming up from, this, uh, from, the, uh, from the gap. And what you see here is uh, the NPL signal. So we filtered out the uh, laser wavelengths. All we see is a white light emitted by the gap. So this is this NPL signal. And then the movie is, is I hope it's gonna be working. The movie, uh, maybe I'm gonna go to automatic. The movie, yeah, shows you how the signal, the intensity of the NPL will evolve as a function of applied bias, okay? So I'm gonna run the movie. You can nicely see, you can nicely appreciate that whenever there is a pulse, a bias, uh, a bias pulse, I'm gonna run it again. There is a flickering of this NPL intensity and it goes with the, uh, it, it nicely goes with the, uh, with the voltage. So everything, uh, every time I get a voltage pulse, I get more signal, okay? And you can see that in this uh, time kinetics, time train of the signals. So this is the NPL as a function of time. Uh, and every time there is a voltage pulse, you can see a drastic change in the NPL uh, signal. It's very surprising, very surprising. How do we understand, how can we, you know, understand that a bias applied is going to change the efficiency of a nonlinear process? Okay, and we're talking about metal. We're not talking about like semiconductors when you change the polarization and uh, of, you know, or the chi three of the material. It's not. It's not the care effect in this respect. Okay, and uh, then it was a. Uh, <laughs> this is where I, I'm going to be playing my Joker, uh, because I've been, you know, heavily uh, collaborating with my two uh, Russian friends, uh, Alex Yuskov and uh, Igor Smetanin at the Lebedev Physical Institute in Moscow, and it turns out that you, it's very. Uh, you know, you play. We playing a, a card, a, a card game, okay? And it's uh, very interesting uh, to have a, a joker in this card game, in the deck of card. And my two jokers were these two uh, Russian friends. And uh, 
So we looked at the problem also from this uh, electron picture, hot electron picture. And um, of course, when you apply a bias in the gap, uh, and this is pictured here, you have uh, you know, an electric field, static electric field, which is basically uh, localized at the tips. And uh, you have this uh, so-called lightning rod effect where you basically confine the electric field at the apex. Okay, and of course, uh, this electric field is associated with basically uh, a change in the uh, density uh, in the surface charge density. So uh, you know uh, you have a, you have a, you, you may have a, a, an excess of charge here, and you may have a depletion of charge of electrons in the other side. So we have basically a capacitive effect here, and uh, in the system. And uh, it turns out that this uh, the electron temperature uh, in the system is depending on many parameters, of course. Uh, it's depending on the laser fluence. It's depending on the uh, lattice temperature, depending on the Fermi temperature. But it's also depending on this parameter. And this parameter is, I don't want to go too much into detail, but it's proportional to the electron density. So you can appreciate that the electronic temperature now scales with the inverse of the square root of the electron density, OK? And the hypothesis for us is to say that, OK, so very locally here, we have a change of this uh, electron density, either as a positive change, we have more electrons, or as a reduced number of electrons uh, in case of uh, in the positive side of the bias. And indeed, and, and, and consequently, is affecting basically the electron temperature very locally. And this is good, and this is a plausible interpretation because uh, this NPL is a surface effect. Okay, so the electron temperature that is responsible for the uh, emission of the light is at the surface. We're talking about electrons that are located at the surface, and if we are locally change their density. It's likely that we're going to be changing their temperature. And because if we change the temperature, the intensity is going to change. So <clears throat> is this plausible? Yes. Uh, so we took, uh, we took the very easy experiments. We took spectra taken at the positive bias. This is this one. Taken, taking spectra with zero bias, this one. We fit that with uh, Planck's law, and we find two different uh, electron temperature uh, uh, which is consistent with what we found. Basically, if we have a reduced um, number of electrons, we have an increased uh, electron temperature, and therefore we expect an increased uh, nonlinear photoluminescence. And we put this also to the test in the following experiments. So imagine now, so I'm recording the, the device here. So we have a positive electrode, negative electrodes. We have a gap here. And the red dot is basically the position of the laser. OK, so and uh, so in one experiment, we slightly position laser towards the positive electrodes. So we have NPL signal, which is essentially coming from this electrode. The other experiments, we slightly downshift our excitation spot. So we have mostly light coming from the uh, ground electrodes. And in the last experiments, we kept the uh, la the uh, the, the, the excitation towards the, left, the bottom electrodes, but then we switch the voltage, the polarity of the voltage. Okay, so let me go through the curves. So when we have a positive bias and we're looking at the positive sides, whenever we apply uh, the pulse, the positive pulse, we have an increase of the NPL signal. Okay, and this is consistent with this picture. On the positive sides, we have an accumulation of positive charges, holes basically, so reduced number of electrons which leads to an increased NPL. Now, if we go on the other side, this is where the region where electrons are accumulating, okay? You see the reverse. Whenever you apply the bias, this is a red curve, you have a quenching of the nonlinear photoluminescence. So it's very consistent with this. And then the final proof is that, okay, locating there, we change the polarity. We go from a quenching whenever you have a bias, Okay, so 180 degree phase shift between the bias, sorry, between the bias and the LPN response. And we have, a, when we have, when we go positive, when we have, when we change the polarity, sorry, when we have a negative bias, we have a, a, a enhancement of the NPL. So this is very much consistent with this picture. Okay, uh, last slide before I conclude. 
Um, so obviously things needs to be connected. Uh, so the what we do now is trying to control, you know, remotely the NPL. You know, I was showing you be, uh, before we have, uh, in the case of a nanowire, if when we excite at one hand, we have NPL delocalized all the way through the nanowire and to the very end. And now we are basically trying to modulate not the input, not the NPL at the excitation, but the NPL at the remote location. So we fabricated this device. So this is a gold nanowire. Uh, you will excite the laser right here. There will be a plasmon propagating at the pump wavelengths down the wire. This plasmon is going to create nonlinear photoluminescence all over the place, but we're going to be trying to modulate electrically the very end only. Okay, so we have this end phase and uh, NPL generation, and we're going to be applying a bias there just to see if we can switch also on and off or increase or quench the, uh, the NPL. And this is a movie here uh, of this device. So you can recognize the excitation spot. Here you can recognize the surface plasma. Well, you don't see it, but this is taken at the NPL wavelengths. So you can see that the nonlinear photoluminescence delocalized throughout the structure. And you have this nice uh, end phase scattering of this NPL. And then uh, I'm going to run the movie. And you can see that I have a very strong response of the NPL, uh, which can be controlled by the bias at the very end. So we're still working on this. It's our all preliminary res uh, result. They are not published yet. Um, we, we are trying to understand uh, all the physics behind this. OK, so uh, let, me, uh, let me go and conclude. And uh, there are basically three take home messages um, that I want you to take is First of all, that the radiative, this nonlinear photoluminescence is uh, originating from, you know, uh, the radiative fate of hot electrons, okay, following the absorption of the pulse. The nonlinearity, these hot electrons basically are generated by all over uh, the surface plasma. When the surface plasma exists, there is this hot electrons and there is NPN emission. And this allows us to do some engineering. And this nonlinear photoluminescence can be actively controlled by electrostatic means by using this by using the electron uh, by using the electron density. Uh, and uh, yeah, so what's next is of course trying to do some reconfiguration of this Boolean gates with activation voltages. Okay. So trying to do something more complex, we have inputs, outputs, and of course, if we apply bias, we can change the level of the outputs and therefore reconfigure the gate at will. Okay, so this is ongoing experiments. And uh, also we would like to understand a little bit more why is this, uh, the dynamic of this NPL modulation I just showed you before is, is slow. You can see that there is some, uh, uh, you know, second kind of uh, decay dynamics uh, going on also in this uh, in this system. So there are probably uh, multiple effects taking place that we're trying to understand. So with this, I'm sorry, I was a little bit long. Uh, and I really thank you for your attention and I'd be really glad to take up any questions that you guys may have. Alex, thanks a lot for outstanding presentation, astonishing results. I'm, I'm very glad that Diana managed to invite you here. So we have some thanks. time for, for, for discussion. So Andre, you were first, please. Thanks. Yes, please. Uh, Alex, thank you for the fascinating talk. So I, I have uh, three questions. First question about the gap control, because as I understand, you need a tunnel junction, you need to control the gap. It's very precisely at the less or nanometer scale. How do you manage with it? Well, it turns out not, actually. Um, there, we need to have a tunnel junction if we want to uh, generate light by uh, injecting electrons. Okay. Yes. This this is this is correct. So we need to have a tunneling junction, and these tunneling junctions are usually produced by uh, electro migration of the nanowire. So this is one part. The second part is when we do this optical excitation in order to produce this nonlinear photoluminescence. Uh, it turns out that um, the uh, size of the gaps are not that important. At the end of the day, what's, what, what, is, what is important is the electric field. Uh, so if you have a larger gap, uh, you apply more bias, basically, and you sort of see the same effect. Of course, the smaller, the better. And uh, for this optical excitation, we are usually uh, working with 
gaps that are in the uh, 30 to 50 nanometer range. So we are far off uh, tunneling uh, transport. Mm -hmm. However, however, and that's, I thank you for the question because this uh, can, is basically part of the story. So you see this slow dynamics here. I don't know if you can see my, my, my cursor here. You have a slow dynamic, which is associated to this. And this is linked to uh, modification of the gap. So it's a stressed, tr stress induced modification of the gap when you apply the bias. So there are basically two things happening. I don't want to be too long on to this because this is still uh, under uh, investigation, but there are um, defects that are created inside the gap in terms of uh, uh, oxygen vacancies. And the second type of defects that are created are basically uh, you do electrochemistry by injecting inside the gap gold uh, atoms that are forming clusters. And uh, we, are do we don't know yet uh, what is the precise role of these clusters at um, the dynamics of the NPL inside, uh, the, you know, you know, close to the electrode. So this is, we're still investigating this, but I would say for optical excitation, gaps are in the 30 nanometer range. Uh, for electrical yes. excitation, we are in the tunneling regime. Okay, the, the second question about the energy consumption, because we, we are talking about some Boolean, Boolean operations, some logic. So yeah. uh, did you estimate the, uh, how much energy do you need per one operation? And did you compare this value with uh, electrical circuits or? No, we are far away from competing with electric circuit in terms of, uh, you know, the, you know, plug wall efficiency. Again, yeah, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, no. The, uh, the thing is there are two, I would say, you know, the setting points are twofold. First of all, we're doing a calculation at ultra fast speed because, you know, plasmas we propagate, uh, you know, very fast down in the structure. And the response time of the NPL is also on the order of 500 femtoseconds. So it's doing fast. And second of all, we don't need uh, to cascade structures. Okay, cascading for us would be a killer. So what we do, what we want to have is a, a complex structure where we can have multiple outputs, multiple inputs, and fish uh, for these gates at the different outputs. Okay, so we can simultaneously have, as I showed you before. Let me go back in the first example just to. Uh, yeah, so here for the same set of Boolean inputs, we can have four different gates, okay? Just simply by looking at the different outputs. So we have something which is universal. We don't need to have cascaded uh, structures. The same structures can realize multiple, you know, Boolean gates. And, uh, and this is one of the advantage. So we don't have to cascade. Of course, efficiency is, yeah, we have to make a setting point somewhere. Uh -huh. So, and, and the last questions are quite general. So uh, we see that the, the main thing that we need is like a, a hot electrons. And this, yes. uh, and this hot, uh, for this hot, we can afford to use this uh, hot, hot electrons. But what about the dielectric materials? So in principle, we can also excite very high density of free electrons by a pulse, even in silicon. Yeah, I understand, yeah. Could we, could we observe something? Of course, there may be the damage le uh, level for metal is much, much more higher. So it's because of the high temperature conductivity, but in principle, could we observe something similar in dielectric materials? I would say so. I would say so. I think uh, for me, the precondition is to have, you know, many electrons. So something that has, a, you know, a, a, a Fermi C. Right, so uh, some free, a large density of free electrons, and as long as you can absorb the pulse, you will see uh, you will see such a signal. And we've seen this with with ITO, for instance. ITO has a lot of free carriers, and uh, and we see a very similar signal. But ITO with a very high doping level, I, I think. It's uh, well, it's IT, standard ITO that we produce in the uh, in the lab. So. Uh, yeah, uh, it's conductive, so I don't have the value. Maybe, maybe a kilo ohm uh, conductivity uh, per uh, per centimeters. So standard, mm -hmm. standard, I would say. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Yeah, Dima, please. Yeah, thanks a lot, Andrea. And Dima, your your question, please. Uh, okay, uh, Alex, thank you very much for such an impressive talk, and uh, I would like to ask you about your second phases uh, at the conclusion. 
you said that, uh, and during the uh, talk, you said that photoluminescence is somehow transferred by a plasma polariton, but uh, let us imagine that we use a kind of resonant plasmonic structure. So could we, could we somehow modulate our photoluminescence by the resonances of the structures? Yes, definitely. So you can uh, definitely shape the spectra uh, by uh, including uh, localized surface plasma resonances. So instead of having like, uh, you know, the plank tail decaying all the way down in the visible, you will have a nice uh, resonance uh, sitting somewhere. You can definitely uh, yeah, use this at your advantage in order to engineer uh, the spectral response and therefore engineer the intensity of the yield. Um, if you have a double resonance structure, all the better. If you, you know, if you have a resonant at absorption at the laser wavelengths, uh, then you will carry uh, electrons at higher temperature. And then if, yeah, if at emission, you also have a, a resonance, it will be also favorable to, for the emission because the local density of states will kick in. Definitely, yeah. Thank you very much. Nima, thanks a lot. Jonathan, always welcome. Yeah, so first I'd, I'd like to join everybody else in uh, saying that uh, I really enjoyed the talk. Very nice results, clearly presented. Thanks a lot, I enjoyed it. Um, but now I, I commented on this already, uh, this non-locality story, nice story that you mm -hmm. uh, showed. And if I understood correctly, then your vision here or your explanation here is that um, the non-locality is mediated by the surface plasma polaritons, right? That's correct. Um, yeah, so I, I actually think that you don't really need the polaritons here. So, so in the sense that uh, I would say that the energy, the heat, the temperature rise would be also mediated by just the electrons, just by the thermal conductivity of the metal, which is extremely high. And uh, in fact, maybe the set of experiments you have could serve as a nice way to uh, test this, to test the thermal conductivity of the electrons. Uh, and we, we studied a couple of uh, aspects of this uh, and we saw some non-trivial uh, 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 results with Nick Van Hulst. And in fact, you can test this hypothesis and see the propagation speed, does it correlate to uh, thermal conductivity or to the surface lasmon? You can maybe explain the, the, the EPL results, the slow response that you emphasized a couple of times. So I think that would be a very interesting uh, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely point right. to investigate Agreed. further. Yeah, it's, it's a very good suggestion. So because, um, yeah, it's true that this uh, hot electrons will have some kind of a diffusion mechanism and um, we, we could, we could pre uh, maybe probe uh, you know, the diffusion lengths of this uh, hot electron mechanism through a measurement of these. Yeah, if you do yeah. the pump probe, that yeah, would yeah, be beautiful. Absolutely. I mean, we did this with, well, I didn't do anything, but uh, Nick Van Hulst did it with yeah. transient reflectivity, but absolutely, with the PL, yeah. that, that could be a, some yeah. correlation would be interesting. It's, it's a good suggestion. However, however, uh, Jonathan, uh, the plasmon is still key here. And uh, we've, uh, I, I maybe I encourage, I didn't I'm not gonna be showing the results here because I don't have it on this slide, but I encourage you to look at these papers. We really went into, uh, into deep, uh, deep understanding of what's going on. If we don't have a plasma excited, say we change the polarization or we change the location of excitation in order not to favor the excitation of the Yeah, plasmon. it is the heat source. It is yeah, a heat source. It doesn't, the, la, the, the field doesn't have to go all the way to the other side of the structure because the heat will do it itself. That's my point. But if, uh, the, the yeah, he is a heat source. But I mean, okay, so my, my vision is the following, is that of course it's a heat source, but the heat source for the electrons, right? So you get the, uh, you get the plasma, which sucks up your input energy and the plasma is propagating down the structure. And uh, of course the plasma has some losses of course, uh, uh, plasma will have some losses. So these losses will basically heat up the electron gas because it's a pumped plasma, it's a femtosecond, 200 femtoseconds pumped plasma. So uh, during the propagation, it will exchange its energy with the, uh, with the electrons as any kind of uh, optical excitation. And this, uh, and everywhere inside the structure where the plasma goes, it excites electron at a temperature, which is proportional to its local electric field. So it's more in the electron temperature is higher 
where the plasmon is born and it's lower when the plasmon dies. And during all this period here, you have this emission of uh, the, the, the radiative fate of these hot electrons, which is reminiscent of the electronic temperature, basically. So I agree with you. So the surface plasma is a source of, of the heat, but not the heat of the of the lattice, heat of the electron temperature. I don't know if yeah. I make okay. I mean they are, they are closely coupled. Um, yeah, yeah, but of course. like you say, I mean the qualitative description is similar, I suppose. And maybe it, it would be interesting to investigate the quantitative aspects and to see which one contributes more or less. I agree. I agree. That, that, I agree. That's nice. I agree. Good, thanks. Sure, welcome.